All right, we're here to talk about a new series that I'm going to be doing called Meta Analysis, where I go over a deck list from the better performing players in major Soul Forge Fusion tournaments. Uh, this is the first uh, one of these that I'm recording, although I may go back and do this for some of the earlier tournaments before this tournament. So if this this will get put into a playlist, and if you're watching this after having watched two or three previous videos, understand that this is the first one I recorded. Uh, so I'm gonna time travel or something. I don't know. Anyway, so let's let's get into this. We're gonna talk about the decks that performed well at the uh, online shuffle bus invitational, which was held on February 25th, 2023. I'm recording this a couple days after the tournament. Um, so uh, the Shuffle Bus Invitational was a, uh, was a tournament that was put on by the Shuffle Bus uh, group. Like they have a, a Twitch and I believe a YouTube and uh, a Discord. So I don't know, like the the Shuffle Bus organization, the Shuffle Bus conglomerate. I don't know. You can kind of pick your favorite uh, adjective or descriptor there. But anyway, let's get in. Let's get into some decks. Um, all right. Let's see. So this was. I'll scroll down the list of performers at the tournament. Uh, I swear I am not doing this just out of uh, gratuitous self promotion uh, because I ended up finishing second in the tournament which uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and look at my video playlist for my videos, uh, for my perspective from the tournament, which if you're watching this within the first few days of it being uploaded, won't exist. But if you're watching this anytime after, you know, the, the very beginning part of March in 2023, I'll have videos up. So I'll try and link that in the description when they become available. But these were the top finishers. Uh, Weekend won the tournament. I said I, I was fortunate enough to get second. Uh, Gorman got third. Uh, Rusty, who's a friend of mine actually from my local, who just started playing online, uh, managed to get fourth, which was really cool. Uh, they cut to top. There were 24 players, and they cut to top uh, to top four, and then they played the four uh, the semis and the finals. Um, and this is how it finished. So I'll scroll down the list a little. You'll see a lot of names that you know, uh, and some that you might not. Um, in terms of screen names, not everyone has their screen name on here, so. Uh, Forgive me if I am missing some people that I have not memorized the screen name and the actual name, but this is the rest of the performers. I'm going to scroll down to 16 because the top 16 players finished 500 or better, uh, meaning they won as many games as they lost, and we're, those are the decks we're going to be analyzing. And the reason that I'm, as I scroll down here just a little more, the reason that I am sticking with the top 16 is because I think it makes more sense to analyze the meta, not of every single deck that was entered into the tournament, uh, but rather the decks that finished at least 500. And that's not a slight against people who did not uh, finish 500 or better. That's just more so because the point of these videos is to analyze the competitive meta in the sense of what's doing well, that if we start throwing in things at the very bottom of the list, then it doesn't necessarily capture what decks are having the most success. And of course, remember, it's not just about the decks, it's about the pilot as well. You see a lot of known names on this list, um, prominent members of the community. So it's, it's not quite as simple as just going, well, this deck is fundamentally better, therefore uh, we can ignore the fact of whether the pilot was good or not. So it's not really that simple, but in terms of uh, an easy shorthand to do it this way. That's how I'm going to do it, at least for this video. Maybe I'll revisit that decision in the future. Okay, so those are, those are the top 16. So let's, uh, let's look at some stats before I break down individual decks. All right, so just a moment. Uh, here we go. Okay, so here are the... Oh, no, can't do that. Here are the... Um, the decks for uh, the top 16. There are a lot of things that will jump out, uh, jump off the page on this particular list. I'll highlight them all, but we'll go, we'll go in order. So first of all, um, one of the more interesting aspects of the top 16 in this tournament is that pretty much every deck had purple. Um, every deck had, pretty much every deck had Necrium. Of the top 16, only two decks did not have Necrium. 
there was one green red deck and there was one red blue deck and there were no green blue decks so the only two out of the top 16 decks did not have purple uh the the by far the most common uh fusing was purple and green usually life gain i'll talk about that in a second but purple and green had nine of the top 16 decks which is more than everything else combined so that is by far at least for this tournament the dominant meta uh, and then purple red was second with three decks uh, by the way purple green represented the winner and the one of the two people that lost in the semifinals so tied for third um, were purple green purple red was another one of the tie decks uh, there were three total decks purple blue were there were two decks that were actually very similar in archetype i was running one of them and i finished runner up and then you know you see the rest of the stat there i tried to roughly divide the decks into what i view as archetypes um, some of these are more precise more precisely defined archetypes and some of them are less precisely defined the most prominent archetypes totally unsurprisingly if you played any games online recently are a life gain with Krogius and life gain without Krogius. Without Krogius is slightly more than life gain with Krogius, uh, but you can see that that's the most prominent archetype. Purple red spells uh, was next tied for life gain with Krogius with three decks. Hybrid recursion, uh, which I will explain more when I go into the, the when I break down some of the individual decks, uh, but specifically those are the two purple blue decks that were run and uh recursion meaning like stitcher nonsense and other things and uh there were there were two of those decks i was running one and then someone else in the top 16 had one and then there were uh, four other decks one was uh, i defined three of them as mid-range because they're just kind of like a handful of good cards that aren't necessarily super aggro from first glance i could be a little bit wrong about that maybe they were slightly more aggressive than mid-range um, for those of you who don't know what mid-range is, it's generally a term that's, in this context, used to define decks that uh, don't necessarily, like, aren't necessarily fully aggro, like, they don't try to kill you by, like, turn 5 or anything. They wouldn't mind killing you by turn 5, but they don't that's not necessarily the way they're built. Um, but they're also not super late-game decks, like, it's not, they run not running, uh, they're not blue decks with 5 charge-plated, 5, with 3 charge-plated creatures or 2, whatever, that sort of thing. So they're kind of a mid-range thing. So there's one red-green mid-range. There's one purple-green with Krogius. I put a special note there, Grandfather, because it's kind of a meme now that Grandfather plays the Krogius deck, and I'll show you that one later. Um, and But he didn't have a lot of life gain, so I don't group that in with the life gain decks. It was just, just purple-green with Krogius. And then there was yet another deck that didn't have Krogius, but it was purple-green mid-range type stuff, and then a red-blue mid-range deck. Um, so in terms of the actual cards that were contained, this is... This is my arbitrary list of, of high-profile cards in the meta. This is not an exhaustive list. This is not, uh, this is not a, uh, a list that's intended to capture all good cards by any means. But these are just things that jumped out at me when I was analyzing. The, of the top 16 decks, four of them had Krogius, including the winner. Uh, shambler or Shambling creatures. There were a total of nine Shambler or Shambling creatures in the top 16 decks. I believe uh, one deck had two of them, so I think that functionally means eight or half of the top 16 decks had Shambling, which is uh, pretty crazy if you think about it, in, just in terms of, that just means almost every purple deck in the top cut, um, well, maybe not almost every purple deck, but uh, the majority of purple decks had some sort of Shambling in them. Glowhive was a very popular one because that's one of the key components of life gain, it's a life gain engine and a life gain payoff at the same time. It gains a life and it does stuff with the life gain. Either Mantis or Forge Seal was in five decks. The number there is six because Grandfather's deck, which is kind of a meme, and we'll talk about that in a second, has uh, both of them. So, but I counted the total number. So there were actually five decks, I think, that either had, if I counted correctly, either had Mantis or Forge Seal. Necromancer was in five different decks, including my deck, the runner up deck. Uh, Dreadbolt are, the reason I highlighted Dreadbolt because I view that as the, you know, it's probably the best, uh, it is the best single removal spell in the game in all likelihood, um, at least in set one. I'm still going over set two stuff, but it's at least in set one. Um, there are better mass board damage like Epidemic, Firestorm, that sort of stuff, but in terms of just a level gated, unconditional other than the level gate kill of a creature, uh, Dreadbolt is, is very prominent. 
Uh, there were four Stitcher decks, there were three Blight Witch decks, one Omni in the top 16, and so the thing that surprised me the most with all these purple decks is that only if I, again, if I counted correctly, I just kind of went through fairly quickly, but if I counted correctly, only one of the decks had Dark Heart in terms of life gain, and that was a purple-red spell deck. Now, you could say, well, you wouldn't necessarily assume that Dark Heart would be in every life gain deck, because if it's a green-purple green, green -purple deck that doesn't have a lot of uh, life gain mechanisms... Uh, or excuse me, doesn't have a lot of... We're talking about Dark Heart. If it's a green-purple deck that doesn't have a lot of spells, then Dark Heart isn't necessarily a great inclusion, um, because you're... You know, if you're not playing spells, Dark Heart is just a bad creature. Like, it's it's 2-8, it can never hit face. So... Um, you really kind of have to be playing spells. So that is the breakdown of all the deck, uh, the decks that existed. Let's go over some of the individual decks here. Uh, just a moment. Okay, let's go over some of the individual decks. This was Weekend's uh, winning deck. I uh, played, I actually ended up playing Weekend twice in the tournament, so I will talk a lot more about the ins and outs of this particular deck when we get to uh, my individual videos of my uh, journey through the tournament. So I'm not going to linger a lot on this particular deck right now, because I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about it, because um, he was two out of my six matches at the tournament. Which, by the way, I don't think I mentioned, the tournament itself was four rounds, and then they cut to top four, so they played semis and finals. So if you made the finals... You ended up playing six total games, and if you did not, uh, if you made the semis, you played five, and if you made top cut, sorry, if you did not make top cut, but played all the, you know, preliminary games, there were four games. So, um, so, I mean, just, just at a brief glance, you can kind of see, um, you know, how this is a, this is a pretty powerful deck. It has a, a several different options. It's got a bunch of uh, stealth creatures, uh, camouflage creeper is very good. It's got Spectre, Hag for more life gain. Necrotic stuff, Ossuary mech, uh, and some aggressive stuff, and the Shambling Druid uh, Betrayer, which is kind of cool. And then it's got Forge Seal, Krogius, Glow Hive, um, standard green pieces that are all very good, and Swamp Moss is a good life game payoff. Uh, likewise, this is this is another deck I'm not going to talk a great deal about. This is the deck that I ran. Um, and got runner-up in the tournament with. The reason I'm not going to talk a lot about this particular deck, I'll just go over a couple things real quickly, but I'll do it in much greater detail, because this is the deck that I'm playing in the tournament, and it has a bunch of different um, aspects to it that I'm going to discuss in greater detail in my tournament coverage. Uh, but in a nutshell, this deck does a ton of different things, but the peak nonsense is that it's got a rallying inventor, um, and my uh, Forge Born that I played was Steel Rosetta, which is... This is pretty much the absolute ideal, uh, as it turns out. I only I only made this pairing uh, three days, two days before the tournament. So the tournament was, I played a couple practice games, but this was really the first time I ever played the deck. Um, but I, what I d rapidly discovered is that this is pretty much the ideal forward board combination for what I was doing. Um, but the deck has, the purple deck is just, the purple half is just good cards, not deck, has a bunch of different stuff. Um, but it has, it has a Shambler that self-triggers because the Apparition can kill something upon play. Um, it has a Necromancer, which is always just crazy. It has a Stitcher, uh, which also kills minions. Uh, it's a great fuse for the Stitcher. So a lot of times you would just play Rallying, uh, and then if you had a board, you could play, you know, play it on top of something. You could uh, then Stitcher back a Rallying Inventor. Um, you can then kind of go nutso with Ghastly Renewal, at level three, if you get, you know, when you get to the later phases of the game, like uh, cycle three and four is when this deck really shines because you get to reanimate inventors, uh, rally inventors, and also like, like replace them, repurpose them. It's just a lot of c complex interactions and crazy nonsense. And I'm just starting to scratch the surface of this because I've, you know, like I said, I've only had it as a few stack for a handful of days. So that was the second place deck. The top Rounding out the top four, we have this green-purple deck that is, uh, it's another life gain deck. It's Shambling Patron. Um, it's got Blight Witch for some spell activity. There aren't a ton of spells, so uh, Blight Witch. I did not, I don't, if I recall correctly, I did not play against this deck in the tournament. Um, so I think the Shuffle Bus has on their uh, YouTube channel 
the recordings of the top cut, including the semifinal game, which I only watched a little of because that game was going on after my semi, but before my final, so I was getting some food real quick and I only caught part of it. Um, but you can kind of see how there are some powerful spells here, Soul Reap, um, the Tanimate, that sort of stuff, and it's just got a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of some life gain payoffs there, uh, some board swarm. It's kind of, it's a life gain deck, but it's somewhat balanced in terms of what you can do. Um, and I think it's got, uh, yeah, Spirit Reaper. It's got a handful of beasts in the deck, but it's just pretty, pretty solid green purple life gain. The other top four cut, the other, excuse me, top cut tied for third place deck was this deck that I played against Rusty. Uh, sorry, that Rusty played against me. Um, I'll talk a lot more about that in the coverage videos because I played this deck, so I'm going to go into much greater detail analyzing it. But it's a red purple spells pile with Blight Witch. Um, it's got a lot of a lot of good spell value here, um, and you know it's got pretty good Sunder, Stimble, some of the Swarm, Gathering Storm. It's got a, some really good uh, key cards. It's got this card Chaining Invocist, which is one of the crazier fuses I've seen in red. Um, and Inflaming Sentinel, which is just another bonkers card when you're playing spells. So it's just got a lot of a lot of purple, red, decent spell stuff. And then I'm, the rest of the decks either were did not make cop cut because they were three one or uh, or two two, and they there, the three some three ones did not make top cut because they lost out on breakers. Um, so I'm just going to go through them real quickly, not spend a ton of time, but just to show you what the decks look like. Feel free to pause the video if you want to look at them in greater detail. This is a, a Mantis deck <coughs> that I think this was my red green mid range deck because it has some spell stuff. You can tell it's got Flame Jet, it's got Lightning Tamer, so it plays different uh, creatures. It's got Windspark Elemental, which is a great utility creature. You could do some Uranti nonsense. Um, then it's got some Board Swarm Summoning Council. Combat War Tusk. I don't remember uh, what, I don't know rather, what uh, Forgeborn they used, but some some utilitarian stuff that they could have used in different Forgeborns. That's what, that's what the next deck looks like. Moving on to number six in the standings. Again, another purple-green life gain deck uh, that, uh, actually this I think might have been, I might have called this purple-green mid-range because there's not a ton of the typical, like, there's no shambling creature. Uh, there is Glow Hive, but there's not a whole lot else. There is Mantis, so that definitely helps some. Mantis lead the charge, summoning council, and then you just have a bunch of value in purple. Ghastly Renewal is pretty good for stuff like Glow Hive and other key pieces, I would imagine, or for Mantis. Um, it's Rats Will, um, not some decent removal. Moving on, we have another purple green deck. This is. This is another deck that's got some decent life gain, but not a lot, although it does have Sprint Dryad. One of the few decks, surprisingly, in the top cut, even though green-purple was a prominent um, was a prominent color fuse, there, and life gain was a very prominent theme, there weren't a ton of Spring Dryads. I assume it was just by coincidence. You have Dryad, Talison, uh, and, you know, Soul Reap, which is a fantastic card that's been in a couple decks so far. You have Lead the Charge, Summoning Council, Toxic Spores, Lissian Rain. So we have a lot of board. This deck has a lot of board swarm, which is great with the Dryad, because you keep getting life that way. Um, it's interesting, the purple itself doesn't have a ton of life gain outside of Soul Reap. This is a life gain payoff, but uh, one Vampiric creature, I guess, so that is a thing. But... Other than those, I mean, it has a... Oh, a Betrayer Allomancer. I didn't catch that because they don't flag them on these lists that way. But that's pretty funny. Um, and Necromancer is fantastic, as I've already said. So a little bit of life gain in purple. No shambling stuff. Fair amount of life gain in green. So I think I probably did classify this as a green-purple life gain deck. Uh, then the next deck we have, again, another Necromancer. Uh, Nap Time, which is a fantastic removal spell that'll get better in set two. Against set two, rather. Uh, it's not printed in set two. Glow Hive, um, batter, batter Hide stuff. So Batter Hide Nap Time is a great combination. It, it's really, um, I have this in one of my decks. It's a very profitable uh, mechanism to deal with the, all the creatures out there that, that have crazy abilities, uh, especially if you get to go first. So if there's a creature on the board that has crazy abilities like Shamblers or whatever, you could play Nap Time, and uh, depending upon the level it's at, you either get one, two, one or two creatures, or you get the whole board. 
uh, which can be incredibly powerful. It also knocks everything back, so if you you can use it first if you're on the forge to try to shut off anything that you think might be happening during their turn, or if you're off the forge, it, this can be your last play, and then um, you know all of a sudden your opponent cannot deal combat damage to your face that turn if this is the last play because it shoves everything to the back. So it's it's quite good as a removal card, um, or as as a thing that it affects the game. Uh, what else we got? Next deck. Here's more green purple. It's becoming a theme. This is, oh, excuse me. This is Grandfather's deck that I mentioned we were going to talk about a little in the opening. The reason it's a meme is because uh, he, we joke about him playing Krogius all the time, but this is, like, obviously a legitimately good deck. It's got Krogius, uh, it's got Camouflage Mantis, and it's got Forge Seal, and, you know, other stuff like Nap Time, Primal Surge, that sort of thing. Uh, let's see. I don't know which one of these he used. Uh, in terms of the Forgeborn, I can see arguments for both if you're playing a bunch of minions. Um, oh, and Nova's Might as a finisher is very good. Could have been that. Or it actually, now, never mind, it was probably this. Um, because he has, it's a Krogi deck with Army Commander 4. So that, yeah, this was almost certainly what he played as his Forgeborn. You get to deal life extra, you get to kill stuff. Um, so that's a great, these are all great Forgeborn activations for the Forge Seal and for the Mantis. Um, does not have, like, Grim Reminder, or, sorry, whatever that card is called. Uh, forgive me for a second. Uh, Ghastly Renewal, excuse me. So you can't reanimate the Mantis, but it's still pretty good. Uh, still's got a lot of good, you know, got a lot of good stuff. No Shambler, surprisingly, but it does have a Hag uh, and Dissian Siphon, which is good to deal, to, you know, as an outlet for level 1 Krogius. Uh, Weekend's deck, that one had Siphon that he made good use of as well. So that's, that was Grandfather's deck. Uh, then we have another green-purple deck. Krogius, Glowhive, uh, Lysian Rain, Toxospores, does have Dreadbolt. Stop me, uh, stop me if, you've, if you're sensing a theme. Green-purple uh, with the Shambler, with Krogius, uh, with a Reaper. Crazy nonsense. Uh, here is oh, the, best, the best spell in the game just came to the front automatically. That's funny. Digitize. So this is a this is another blue this sorry not another this is I think this is the other blue purple deck that is actually it does a little bit different things than my deck but it is remarkably similar in the core component uh, I don't know how this person plays the deck uh, but this one has double rallying so I'm assuming they emphasize on that plus a rallying better like this deck is pretty cool um, and it has a stitcher with the double rallying um, and this the Circe is. Uh, inspire, uh, enhance, and then tinker, which, uh, sorry, the Steel Rosetta, that's the Forgeborn, uh, and then the Circe is Army Commander 2, so I don't know which one they used here, um, I will say that this deck also has Ghastly Renewal like my deck, so it's very similar to what it's trying to do, it has slightly more consistent payoffs with the Rallying, I think my purple is probably a little bit better for what the deck is trying to do, but I think their blue is a little bit better for what the what the deck is trying to do. So that's what I called um, a hybrid recursion in terms of Stitcher stuff. Um, but yeah, that seems like a pretty fun deck. Uh, green, another green purple deck. We're nearing the end. We have a few more decks left to examine. So this is another Shambler deck. Uh, but this one has a Betrayer Shambler, a Magnivorous Shambler. If I'm saying that correctly, and uh, in green, which means you get two Shamblers. Uh, you can get two Shamblers in purple, but why not get two Shamblers across two different houses? That's just uh, our factions. That's pretty fun. Um, and then you have, you know, Lead the Charge. Cersei's Call is a great card, uh, not only in general, but also in the meta, because there's a lot of people playing different spells, and it triggers off of every single spell that's played that turn, so it's very good. Ghastly Renewal is just... I, I never thought this card was bad, but my evaluation of it just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And now that I'm saying that, let me... Really late in the video, but let me turn on this label that I should have had about five minutes ago. Sorry about that. Um, it's all right. We're, lear we're learning how to do these videos. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, Polymorpher is a really good removal. And this one also has a Mantis and Lead the Charge. So, you can theoretically get some extra bonus off that. All right. Um, and with the Ghastly Renewal, uh, being able to recur Mantises is... Manti? What's the plural of Mantis? Manti? Mantises? Let me know in the comments. I have no idea. 
All right, here's the red-purple spells deck. Um, the other red-purple spells deck. Uh, I think, actually, I think there might be three total. But, uh, so this one has a Shambler. Uh, Lyria, which is a new, a new one that we haven't seen very much in decks uh, in this particular tournament. And then it's got, you know, other spell payoffs, like Mech Mage is a very good spell, spell payoff. Uh, it's got Heart Seeker and Elemental to punch through some damage. It's got Dreadbolt. All of those fun things. Three more decks. Uh, here, is, here is the only Dark Heart Sorcerer deck in the top cut, unless I missed some. Sorry, in the top half of the finishers, at the top 16 out of 24, so a little more than half. 500 or better. In all the decks we're analyzing, I think this is the only Dark Heart Sorcerer, if I've read stuff correctly. This is a pretty good red-purple spells pile. It's got Brand, which is amazing in these builds. Uh, you also have uh, Uranti for some other stuff. It's got a Chaining Creature, which is super good in spell builds, uh, and Stormcaller, also very good. I talked a lot about that in my uh, footage from FuseFest, so you haven't seen that and are interested, go back and take a look at that. It has a Betrayer Aether Forge Oracle. Ooh, that is sexy. Okay, that's really cool. So uh, you can get a lot of upgrade value there, maybe some of the stuff you're not able to play, you upgrade the spells for later. Um, that's really cool. And then how's good is their Sunder? Their Sunder is pretty good. Not optimal, but Stimble at 2 is good. Ice Armor is eh for, for what you're doing. Um, and then some of the Swarm is also eh. So no Gathering Storm there, but it, it is a pretty consistent, it looks like, deck uh, that uh, does a lot of spell things. Two decks left. All right, we have a uh, red-blue deck. I think this is the only red-blue deck. Where it's got Master, uh, Sparking Omni, which this is the only Omni deck, I do remember that. So you have Master and, let's see, two, three. Four. I think four mages. Still pretty good. So Master and four mages. Um, Steel Eye Researcher for capitalize on minion generation, which you can definitely do with, with Master. It's a very good payoff. Uh, Pulse Mage for uh, creative removal. Steadfast Drone is very good. Uh, War Machine is very good. Not a lot of good blue spells here, uh, but so, and it has, this deck has Rex, but not a lot of dinos, I think. I think it just has, what, uh, Glider is the only other dino? Let's check. So this deck is doing a little bit of everything and not a lot of one thing, which um, is good sometimes and harmful other times. If you need a really high top end output, um, a little bit of everything is not necessarily great. You might rather be doing a lot of one thing. However, it does have a lot of balanced approaches. The little bit of everything approach may not have as much of a top end payoff, but it, it does allow you to do things uh, to be more flexible, is what I'm trying to say. It allows you to be more flexible. So, you draw Steel Eye turn one, then maybe you're leaning heavy into this master payoff to the extent that you can. You don't draw Steel Eye, maybe you're playing a lot of breakthrough creatures, stampeding, uh, summoning glider is great for um, things, and so maybe you try to hit all your dinos and do that sort of thing. Um, there aren't a lot, but there are enough that you could maybe do something. You could also engage in chicanery with, uh, with Pulse Mage, with other nonsense, you could do that. And then they have Conflagrate for, for those mage payoffs like I was talking about. So it's a little bit of everything. Uh, finally, we have, surprise, surprise, another green-purple deck. This particular deck has Crohius, Glowhive, Talison is an interesting card. Um, and then on the bottom, we have a sh one Shambler, we have a Necromancer, which is solid. Summoning Council, Might of the Herd. And then we have the Necro Revive, which is a very good removal spell when used carefully in the right matchups. Uh, brute Meal for some stuff. So, yeah. So this is a decent uh, decent life gain Chromius deck. And that is, that is it for the individual tournament. I will uh, put the, the breakdown here one more time just to kind of go back and refresh what we've looked at. Summary, a lot of life gain, a lot of purple green, not a great surprise to anyone who's followed uh, competitive play for a while, and uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We will do these in the future for major tournaments, as I said, 
Uh, feel free to drop a like and subscribe on this video because the YouTube algorithm gods demand it. Uh, in order to get some circulation for these videos, we appreciate your support. And I think that's all we have for today. But keep tuned, keep tuned to this channel for uh, for future videos on my uh, run through this particular tournament. I'll have that up soon. Uh, odds are, if you're watching this and aren't watching it in the first couple days, then it'll already be up. But if it's not up now, it'll be up very soon. And uh, stay tuned for more good content from Soulforge. See you later.